Blog Talk Radio. Fulfill Radio, a voice you can trust. Broadcasting live presents Two Guys and a Bible with Don Preston and William Bell. Join us each week at 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Central as we bring you exciting, sound, challenging, and comforting messages regarding the end times. Thank you for tuning in today. Don Preston is the founder of Preterist Research Institute, or PRI. Don is a prolific author, having written and published 19 books, a host of audio and DVD studies, and is a debater and defender of the full preterist view. His websites are BibleProphecy.com, Eschatology.org, and DonKPreston.com. William Bell is the founder of AllThingsFulfilled.com Ministries and has a website bearing the same name, and has authored three books, audios and DVDs. He has published hundreds of articles and recordings. And now, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Two Guys in a Bible broadcast with Don Preston and William Bell. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Two Guys in a Bible right here on Fulfill Radio. I'm William Bell, one of your co-hosts, along with Don Preston. Don, how are you today? Is Don here? Let's see. I think I may have to go back out and get him, ladies and gentlemen. Give me a second. We'll see if we can get him in. And I'm, can you hear me now? I'm here. There we are. Okay, great. I'm, I'm here. Um, yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah I, 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 I knew that you were here. <laughs> I just have to go yeah. out and <laughs> let, you, let you in the door, okay? <laughs> okay. That happens sometimes. I, I sat here and had, you know, had the broadcast ready to go. And uh, I had been having a conversation with my daughter, and uh, she counted the time. Now she said, "It's time for you." To... I said, "Yeah, I'm on." And then I realized I hadn't dialed in. And so whenever I dial in after you're on, I have to always go back out and you know uh, take you out and put you back uh-huh. in, so to speak. But that's uh, that's what that, that's all about. So uh, yeah, it's good to be here, man. It's good to see some <laughs> sunshine. I'm glad you're sending me some good weather from Oklahoma for a change. <laughs> well, you better brace yourself because what's coming next. <laughs> <laughs> is definitely not sunshine. We've had yeah. two two days of heavy of heavy rain. We're due for another day of heavy rain. Uh we've got flash flood warnings all over this part of the country. Uh, in fact, I'm sitting here uh on the on the television that my wife is watching. <clears throat> they are reporting on the rescue of a woman that drove off into water on wow. some little small country road. Uh you know, I, I'm constantly amazed at why people continue to do that. I mean, uh, people really need to realize the power of water. Oh, and absolutely. I, I mean, I can testify to that. I was I was almost swept away in a flood one time myself driving a pickup uh, on an old country road. There was what they what we used to call low water bridges in Arkansas. Mm-hmm. And the water water had come up while my nephew and I had gone deer hunting. And on the way back, I, I was thinking, oh, it's not bad at all. But I got out about midway onto this little low water bridge, <clears throat> and a new wave hit. And you, you understand this low water bridge is only a one-car wide bridge. And, right. I mean, it, it, it hit that pickup, and it knocked me right literally to the very edge of that bridge and here comes a tree floating down and i'm thinking this is not going to be good (laughs) and just as it got to my truck it diverted and it only hit my truck just a very small glancing blow and it did not knock us off the bridge and so i crept on off but i I understood right then and there. It's like, well, okay, I will never, ever, ever do that again. Uh, I mean, I knew not to go out there on that bridge, even though the water was really shallow. But again, another wave came and and raised the water level a good six or eight, maybe 10 inches. Well, if you raise the water level six, eight, 10 inches of water that is flowing fast, then you have increased 
the load bearing, the load moving capacity of water three times, three to four times. And so that's that's scary stuff. But you see it every single year, every single rain, every single flood. <clears throat> people just drive right off in it. And unfortunately, tragically, people lose their lives. But anyway, that's uh, <laughs> yeah. You're you're you'll be getting rain in a couple of days, there, William. <laughs> all right. Well, maybe I should go out and plant my little uh, above ground garden that I worked on all this past week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and that might help a little bit. Well, there's been some exciting things going on. I know that you have um, at least a couple of debates coming up, and um, that we've got all kinds of meetings about to start. Yes, with, sir. Um, well, you know, you so you've got we talk a, about a few of those. Go ahead. A little bit. Of, yeah, let's let's talk about some of the stuff coming up here. You've got a debate uh, coming up with Jason DeCosta of the. Uh, Israel only group, <clears throat> and uh, I, I tell you, William, I uh, I listened to a good little bit of his uh, YouTube response to your debate challenge, and uh, <clears throat> in all in all fairness and in all kindness, uh, Jason Acosta needs a dose of godly humility. Um, the arrogance, the the sarcasm, the downright ungodly attitude manifested by this young man uh, is really incredibly unbecoming of anyone who calls themselves a Christian. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, we see a lot of that on Facebook and YouTube. People seem to think <clears throat> because um, I don't know whether it's because they're faceless I don't know whether it's because they of the anonymity. I really don't know what it is, but they seem to think that because they are on the social media that they do not have to manifest the proper attitude, that they can just say anything they want to in the worst possible language that they want to use, and that that's perfectly fine. It's just shameful. And and so when I watched or listened to Jason DaCosta's uh, YouTube response to your uh, debate challenge. Uh, I was just, I was completely and totally turned off by his decorum. It's just the furthest thing from Christian decorum. You know, uh, on the one hand, he says he doesn't have time for all this nonsense uh, to debate you. And yet, of course, he finds countless hours to post article after article or video after video on YouTube. <clears throat> And he says, on the one hand, none of this matters anyway. Well, if it doesn't matter, why is he spending all of his time posting these videos? Uh, I mean, the, the utter inconsistency of the young man uh, is rather staggering. Uh, you, you would think that if it didn't matter, like he says, it doesn't matter, uh, then he would find a better use of his time instead of trying to destroy the faith uh, in the Lord uh, of who whoever listens and watches his videos, uh, it's it's more than obvious that he has an agenda, and uh, it's an agenda having to do with supposedly something that doesn't even matter, and so it's really sad. But anyway, I'm, I'm glad to know that you're going to ha be having a debate with him. You and I, of course, have been sharing uh, thoughts back and forth about the uh, uh, incredibly unbiblical. Uh, doctrine of Israel only. But yes, I've got, uh, it looks as if I've got two debates coming up. I won't mention uh, one of them in any detail right now because we don't have it nailed down. The The invitation is for a two, two-hour debates on uh, a uh, really a worldwide radio station. And uh, <clears throat> I've agreed to it. The other party I assume has, has agreed to it, but I've sent them two emails uh, today with propositions and uh, some suggestions for some protocol. I have not heard back from them, but I'm assuming it will take place. But the other debate is one that a lot of people have asked for for a good little while, and that is I will be having a uh, formal written Facebook debate, Ed Stevens, on the issue 
of whether or not there was a rapture of the church in AD 70. And we've uh, reached agreement on the propositions. We have reached agreement on the, um, the, the rules and, you know, the length and all that kind of stuff like that. And I'm in the process now, as you well know, of formulating preliminary questions for him to answer uh, prior to me drafting my very first affirmative. And so that's, uh, that's kind of where things go. Both of these debates, uh, I've had people ask me time and time and time and time again why we don't do this. And so it now appears that both of these debates will take place. But we'll keep you posted on that. You can be watching for the debate with Ed Stevens on Facebook uh, on Preterist Debate. That's Preterist Debate on Facebook. Uh, there are, I think, about 400 people already signed up to, uh, to read that debate. Once it begins, I'm sure that it will be uh, uh, a whole lot more people will sign up for that because uh, <clears throat> I've just had person after person after person ask me about when this is going to take place. So that's, that's kind of where that's at. And then, as you say, boy, we've got some exciting things coming up. Uh, got a seminar in May uh, coming up in California. There's, there's a get-together, a seminar going to be taking place in Indianapolis that has already stirred up a tremendous amount of interest. There are, uh, it's going to be an exciting year already. That, and that's going to be a huge one in Indianapolis, uh, at least it's expected to be, with uh, some very, very um, important announcements uh, to be made as well with some new preachers and uh, coming aboard, and or at least already aboard, as I understand it, but are going to make some public announcements at that event, which I'm sure is not going to be too pleasant in the ears of those who have <laughs> uh, stood against us. And uh, uh, and you debated, uh, what was his name in Indianapolis? Um, uh, John uh, Welch. Yes, yes. Uh, so it may John not be Welch. pleasant to his ears as well uh, to know that um, John Watson is doing such a fantastic job in that area. And so we commend John That's right. uh, for uh, what he's doing and for the influence he has, as well as the, um, the effort that he's putting forth in teaching the word of God. So um, just really excited about what's going on there. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, when he had a, a debate last year, uh, immediately after publicly proclaiming that he believed the, the truth of covenant eschatology, uh, there were over 400 people present at that formal debate and there were a yes. couple of preachers after that that publicly came out and said, I'm convinced, I'm persuaded. And like you said, uh, I have been told that there will be at least one and possibly two ministers who will make public statements of conviction of the truth of covenant eschatology at this seminar. And undoubtedly, as you said, it won't go over real well with the folks up there who oppose the truth. But that's just happening. I mean, it's, it's happening everywhere. Uh, <clears throat> you know, William, just uh, you, the idea of I, that added leverage is going to be just phenomenal. I mean, you know, the one thing about it, when these preachers come aboard, I mean, they can write, they can speak, they can uh, create videos, and they already have influence. So that's just going to add more momentum to it. It's just absolutely phenomenal. Go ahead. I'm sorry. That's exactly right. Well, let's not forget, we have Preterist Pilgrim Weekend coming up July 12th, 13th, and 14th here at Ardmore, Oklahoma. Uh, really, really looking forward to that. Our seminar theme this year is Back to the Basics, and we've got a great lineup of, of speakers as usual, and I'm very, very excited about it. I want everyone to make their plans to be here, if at all possible. Uh, we hope to be able to live stream it again. And uh, we're hoping that that doesn't cut into our attendance quite as much as it did last year. You know, we had we literally had hundreds and hundreds of people watching live stream, but it cut down on our local attendance. <laughs> it did not reduce our expense, <laughs> our expenses for sponsoring the debate, but everyone was kind enough to chip in, and all of our expenses were met. And, you know, if that can be done, that's fine. Our, uh, the whole point is to get the word out, 
make information available to as many people as possible. It's certainly not about making money in any shape, form, or fashion. So as long as we can break even, as long as we can uh, meet our expenses and our obligations and pay the bills, hey, we're perfectly fine with that. It's great to have all those people there personally. There's nothing like that face-to-face fellowship. So that's why we want to encourage people to make your plans to go ahead and be here, if at all possible. Excellent. Certainly looking forward to that. Uh, I know that Steve Bazin is planning on a gospel meeting sometime around August or September. Uh, Boger will be having a debate with Bill Lockwood uh, in July. Uh, no, that's June, I think. And uh, I don't have the date in front of me at the moment, but I do understand that it's going to be in June. And um, then we'll have our annual eschatology seminar in October. So we're looking forward to that as well. So pretty full year, and uh, I can only expect that, you know, next year is going to be even better. Oh, I think so. I I certainly think so. Yeah. Well, you know, William, we've been talking about the signs of the end, and I got to thinking today, uh, and, and this may be my faulty memory, but I don't think we ever covered the topic of the great apostasy, did we? We did not. So well, the you know, working pretty this, well so far. Okay. <laughs> Boy, that's reassuring. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, one of, one of the signs of the end that Jesus gave uh, in Matthew chapter 24, and, and this is more than remarkable to me. I, I had never seen this until one day I was, uh, I was looking at the, at the Greek text, and when I looked at the Greek text, it was like, oh, wow, that's, that's amazing. Now, I'm going to read from the good old King James, Matthew chapter 24, verse 10 through 12. Then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. Now, when Jesus said, and then shall many, he just simply uses the Greek word poloi. Well, poloi, uh, you know, that kind of gives us a uh, an English word. We talk about things being polyvalent, which means multifaceted uh, and what have you. <clears throat> so it's it's many. Poly is many. Then verse eleven, and many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Once again, it is simply poloi. Then an amazing thing happens in verse twelve, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Well, here, it is not simply poloi. It is hoi poloi, the many. And the New American Standard translation renders this as the love of the majority shall grow cold. So this puts an incredibly magnified emphasis on what Jesus was saying. Jesus was saying, and obviously he's talking about his generation, but he says the majority, the love for the truth of the majority of people would grow cold. They would apostatize. They would fall away. Now, you'll notice that we have here some various causes for this falling away. That is, verse 9, they shall deliver you up to be afflicted, shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. So here's persecution. When he says they shall deliver you up to be uh, afflicted, that's the Greek word philipsis. This is persecution for the cause of Christ. They will kill you. So as a result of this intense persecution, Jesus said many would be offended. In other words, many people would be so scared at the coming persecution that they, they would completely forsake the Christian community. They would betray one another. They shall hate one another. By the way... In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus said a man's enemies shall be those of his own household. 
For a mother shall betray daughter, a daughter shall betray mother, and on and on, which is taken directly from Micah chapter 7, prediction about the time of the second exodus of Israel, the last days of Israel. And so Jesus is drawing on Matthew, or excuse me, Micah chapter 7, the prediction of the apostasy during the second exodus. Well, what happened in the first exodus? Was there not an apostasy in the first exodus, William? The parallels here are incredible. Oh, yes. I mean, you know, they failed in the wilderness uh, quite evidently. Um, many of them went back in their hearts. Hebrews chapter 3 talks about that. You know, those who failed by uh, virtue of their unbelief. And a warning was given to those in the second exodus that um, they would not fall by the same example of unbelief. And, you know, the book of Hebrews talks about the apostasy as well that was taking, uh, taking place uh, during the uh, last days of the um, of the second exodus. So uh, you have it in both. I mean, it's beautiful parallel. As a matter of fact, as you know, as, as you mentioned the second exodus, I was a, um, a forum uh, on Facebook in another room where, you know, they really attacked Christianity. Uh, this was a pro, if you please, you know, Jewish room. And um, I mentioned just as a casual comment, the second exodus where there were some Christians there and one guy, you know, sent me a note. He says, what do you mean by the second exodus? <laughs> and I, you know, pointed, he said, I've never heard that term before. And I kind of pointed it out to him. He gave him a couple of scriptures. And I said, yeah, this is a theme throughout, you know, it's a motif throughout the entire New Testament. And uh, once I kind of made him aware of it, then I'm sure that he's gone on to study it now. But, um, you know, that's a very, very powerful motif in the New Testament. And I've, I've known people in the past who were able to really grasp the whole subject of eschatology based on looking at it from the standpoint of the two exoduses. Well, I, you're right, and I have as well. And I've encountered any number of people who've been Christians for years. And when you mention that second exodus motif, they look at you, you know, they cock their head sideways, and it's like, the what? What are you talking about? <laughs> and and when you when you talk about type and antitype, they seem to grasp a little bit better of the concept but they they just simply they had never heard that there was supposed to be a second exodus this is as this is in spite of the fact that isaiah chapter 11 in predicting the coming of the messiah the lord specifically and emphatically said i will set my hand again the second time to gather to gather the elect out of egypt out of pathros out of cush out of Syria, out of Assyria, et cetera, et cetera. It's a very clear second Exodus prophecy for the days of the Messiah. And yet, once again, I've just encountered so many people that had never even heard the term or the concept. And, you know, I must confess, by the way, William has a little bit of a digression here. Just today I was going through some notes uh, of a former preterist, and he was claiming, okay, you have types that were prophetic, but the antitypes are prophetic as well. And I'm going, what? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that is just incredible. And, and what that does, it, it says that we have a tertiary, a three-level layer of prophecy. You have the types, which were shadows of good things to come. You have the fulfillment of those types, but the, but those uh, those antitypes, which are the fulfillment of the original types, the antitypes then also become prophetic and shadows of something what we can only assume is yet better than what we've got now. I don't know how anything could be better than Jesus. I don't now don't know how anything could be better than salvation and eternal life in the everlasting kingdom could possibly be. But that's the obvious demand of saying, well, the types were fulfilled, but the antitypes have not been fulfilled. I mean, this is just it's just incredible that someone would come up with this kind 
of of a theology. But I must I must say, in all fairness, this is not an uncommon view. What we have in in the post millennial world is we have the view that oh well yes uh, you know you have the types of the old covenant they're fulfilled spiritually in Christ, but now the events. The events of AD 70 are typological of the real end of the age. I know a guy who wrote a book on that. Um, what's yeah, I heard about that oh, book. Dr. Dunn <laughs> Preston. <laughs> that's right. And that's a great book, by the way, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Um, fantastic arguments in that book uh, that just pretty much put that idea to rest, that there is a type uh, following the antitype, or at least the antitype is a type of another uh, that just just will not work. But I encourage you to check out his website and uh, which one is, it's on all three of them, right? BibleProphecy.com, yeah, uh, Eschatology.org, yeah. and DonKPreston.com, and also on Correct. Amazon.com. So you can get a copy of that book. Uh, what's the title of it? AD seventy Shadow or Reality? Uh, AD seventy Shadow of the Real End? Question mark. All right. Very good. Very good. Yeah. Shameless plug for you. But anyway. <laughs> Yes, I appreciate that always. But, but you know, William, this whole concept here uh, of type and antitype, of shadow uh, and reality, is that Micah chapter 7, in predicting this great apostasy, he wasn't predicting two great apostasies. And Jesus never gave any indication that what was going to happen in his generation when he said, they'll deliver you up to tribulation, uh, to affliction, they will murder you, or they will kill you, etc. And because of this, the love of many will grow cold. And he never said, okay, this will happen in this generation, but then guess what? It will happen again at the so-called, you know, in, at the end of the Christian age. No. There was, you know, at, folks, we have said this many, many, many times. This is such a simple yet profound foundational truth. The only age that the Bible ever talks about coming to an end was the age of Moses and the law. So when you hear people talk about, oh, well, we're looking for the end of the age. Biblically, you have to be looking for the end of the Mosaic age. The Christian age has no end. And William, I, I will never forget, I don't believe, in my second debate with Dr. David Hester, that debate was held in Montgomery, Alabama last June, in, uh, there in Montgomery. And in one of my presentations, one of my affirmative speeches, I made that point. And I, you know how we do one, uh, once in a while, William, we, we make a point – and the point is so well understood by us, it's so common to us, that we sometimes lose, lose sight of how powerful that simple fact is. But I made the point. Sorry uh -oh. about that. <laughs> I made the point from the pulpit that David Hester is talking about the end of the Christian age. But, folks, I said, you've got to catch the power of this. The, biblically, the Christian age has no end. And there was a visible wave of shock that went through that audience. People were turning to one another, looking at one another with raised eyebrows. They were going, wow, with their lips. I saw that kind of response on person after person after person. And so I repeated it. I drove the point home. That's why I spent so much time on that point, because it was more than obvious. It was visible that it had made an impression on that audience. So here we have Jesus in Matthew chapter 24. He has just predicted the fall of the temple, the fall of the city. Not one stone should be left standing on top of another, speaking of the temple. The disciples immediately in response to that prediction, say, tell us when shall these things be, what shall be the sign of your coming, and the end of the age. 
Well, unfortunately, the good old King James says the end of the world. It's not the word world. It's the word age. It is literally soon to Leah, Aeonion, I, uh, that I, I may have missed the conjugation of it there. But the point of it is the consummation of the age. Now, folks, ask yourself the question, since, as virtually all commentators agree, the disciples were linking Jesus' prediction of the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, since the disciples were clearly linking his prediction with the end of the age, then ask yourself the question, what age did that temple represent? Well, let's just be abundantly clear here. That temple did not represent the Christian age. And, you know, John Calvin, when he, when he went over these verses, William, John Calvin said the disciples were very clearly thinking about the end of time and the end of the Christian dispensation. Because to them, it was unfathomable to even conceive of the destruction of that magnificent temple unless it was at the end of time. Now, that's a paraphrase, obviously, but that's the gist of what John Calvin said. And the very first time I read John Calvin's remarks, I'm going, wait a minute. Are you telling me the disciples could not imagine the destruction of the temple without thinking about the end of physical creation and the end of time, the end of the Christian age? Uh, were they not aware that Solomon's temple had been destroyed in B.C. 586 B.C.? Were they not aware that that coming or that that event was called the presence of the Lord? Were they not aware that it was called the day of the Lord? Were they not aware that it was called the coming of the Lord? Well, of course, they knew all of that. So the question, therefore, is, why did they have to believe that the destruction of the second temple had to be at the end of the Christian age at the so-called end of time? I mean, that makes no sense whatsoever. And, and by the way, we've got a mutual friend who says that the Greek word parousia, he now says it has to mean literal physical presence. Well, that's interesting. Because Josephus uses the word parousia to talk about the coming of the Lord at the days of the Lord in the Old Covenant. For instance, at the fall of Jerusalem, in B.C. 586 B.C., and in Jeremiah chapter 4 and Jeremiah chapter 5, what do we find? We have the prediction of the coming of the Lord, the day of the Lord, for the fall of Jerusalem in B.C. 586 B.C., and it was called the presence. And it is in the Septuagint, it is the Greek word prosopon, which means face. It's related, not, not directly, it's not a synonym perhaps, but it's, it gets awfully close to the concept. I mean, after all, prosopon is face, parousia is presence. There's not just, you know, there's not just an, a humongous etymological contrast between face and presence. And so here we have those apostles understanding and knowing that the Solomonic temple was destroyed at the face presence of the Lord. They knew that happened in B.C. 586 and that time did not end. So here's Jesus predicting the destruction of the Herodian temple, and yet we are supposed to believe that they just automatically understood that this has to take place when Jesus, as a five foot five Jewish man, comes out of heaven in a physical body riding a physical cumulus cloud 
at the end of the so called at the so called end of the Christian age. Where in the world would they have ever gotten that idea? Nowhere. <laughs> I mean there's nothing in the Hebrew scriptures that indicates at all or, or at any place uh that there was an end of the physical world. I mean, that was not in their vocabulary. It was not in their genre of language and um, in what they understood. They just didn't have it. And so to claim that all of a sudden you're still dealing with these same Hebrews um, in Matthew 24, they're going to change and then start believing that the end of the literal uh, universe or physical world was about to take place. Uh, that's just not reasonable. And um, it certainly would create some problems with many of the prophecies that they had regarding the fulfillment of those things that uh, the Lord was talking about. And of course, as, as um, will be developed in the fur- uh, further discussion on First Thessalonians, it will become very clear that they didn't have such an idea. Amen to that. Well, let, let's get back to this concept of the, this apostasy. I, I think it's very important for our, our listeners to understand that what Jesus was doing in Matthew chapter 24, and I've already indicated, I mean, Micah chapter 7 predict, predicted what Jesus is saying. Jesus is drawing on a well-established, well-understood, well-accepted, Jewish narrative of eschatology. Now, this came as a remarkable revelation to me, William. Uh, and what I mean by that is I just simply didn't know it. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, and it's just simply my own ignorance. For some years, I did not realize that there was such a well established Jewish timeline of eschatological events for the last days. Uh, You know, but that goes back to my ignorance of the Old Testament, my ignorance of Hebraic concepts and ideas, uh, which is just an unfortunate reality. And I, I try every day to correct that. But what I began to tap into, the reality that the Old Testament, and this, of course, is where the Hebrews got their concepts. This is where they got their own timeline. But the Hebrews from the Old Testament had developed this timeline narrative of the events of the last days. They believed that in the last days, now by the way, a few, you know, one or two of these constituent elements, they might flip-flop, in, insofar as order of occurrence, but they were all absolutely undeniable elements, constituent elements, vital elements of the last days. But they believed that Elijah would come before the coming of the great and the terrible day of the Lord. Elijah would, would come. He would settle disputes concerning marriage, for instance. Oh, by the way, what do you find John the Baptizer doing. Are y'all whistling down John there? The... Do what? <laughs> I'm sorry. Could you hear that too? <laughs> I could slightly. I'm trying to. Keep, I'm trying to keep the noise down in the background, and I uh, must have. I must have more than one mic on. If you were able to hear that, so I tried to mute my mics, and it didn't didn't help. Anyway, go ahead. Sorry about that, audience. Anyway. Okay. Well, Jesus identified John. As Elijah, Matthew chapter 17, 10 and following. Okay, what was Elijah supposed to be to do? Well, in rabbinic literature, Elijah was supposed to come, and he was supposed to be a judge of the law. He was supposed to call Israel back to the law, Malachi chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, where his message was to be, uh, keep the law of Moses, my, my servant. And then, as I mentioned there momentarily ago, Elijah was supposed to settle disputes about marriage. He was supposed to settle uh, marital issues. Well, what do we find John the baptizer, who was Elijah, saying? He said to Herod, 
that he was married to his brother's wife, and he said, you're not allowed to have her. So here is John the baptizer as Elijah doing exactly what the rabbis said was going to happen when Elijah came. That's point number one in the Jewish narrative, the timeline of the last days. In the last days, there will be, guess what? A great apostasy. Now, this is where you find a little bit of a tiny bit of a flip-flop in in some of the uh some of the uh some of the narrative blog talk. Uh, we had somebody texting me there, William, trying to find out where we were, whether blog talk or speaker. So Jan is uh, sending him a message. <laughs> so anyway. Yeah, I, I posted the link to Facebook. Okay. Well, they, evidently they didn't see it. But anyway, uh, in, in this timeline, sometimes you have the great apostasy first, followed by the great tribulation. More often than not, you have the great tribulation followed by the uh, great apostasy. But whichever place you put it, you have in the last days the Jewish understanding that there was going to be the great tribulation. Now think about this, folks. Here are the Jews who for centuries had been teaching about the coming of a great tribulation. Here is now Jesus in Matthew chapter 24 speaking about the coming of the great tribulation and the great apostasy. And he said, the love of the majority will grow cold. And you know, William, in one of the most remarkable passages, uh, I, I remember I was living in Shawnee, Oklahoma at the time. And I was actually getting ready for my first public debate. I knew that my opponent, who is a premillennialist, a dispensationalist, I knew that he would appeal to the prophecies of the great apostasy. Because in newspaper articles, he very often alluded to it, that we, we were seeing the great apostasy take place in Christianity every single day. You've got this, and you've got that, and you've got this, and that, uh, and that going on. And so as I studied the subject of the great apostasy, first of all, I saw this in Matthew chapter 24, verse 12, that I've already shared. The love of the majority will grow cold. Well, then you have Luke chapter 18. In Luke chapter 18, after talking about in chapter 17 <clears throat> of the coming of the Son of Man, and he told them, pray that your flight be not on the Sabbath, Matthew chapter 24. And if you're on the rooftops, do not go down to gather your stuff. Flee. Remember Lot's wife which means flee, don't look back. And he, he said in response to the Pharisees, Pharisees and the Jews who believed and hoped and desired that the coming of the kingdom was about to appear immediately, Greek word parakrema, meaning right then, right there, basically. And Jesus said, no, uh, the kingdom of heaven does not come with observation. The kingdom will not come because, immediately because the Son of Man must first suffer and be crucified and rise from the dead in this generation. So here is Jesus talking about the coming persecution. As a matter of fact, he told his disciples, the days are coming in which you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man. Now, what that meant was they were going to experience persecution to such an extent that they were going to wish that that they could go back to the days where when they were with Jesus during his three and a half year ministry. And 
you know, the crowds were there, the adulation was there, the popularity was there. But now, now, he said, things are going to change. And in verse 22, he said, you're going to desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man. So with that context, that context of trouble coming, that context of persecution coming, Jesus spoke a parable to them in chapter 18, verse 1 and following, in what is known as the importunate, the persistent widow. Some might say the nagging widow, (laughs) to use modern parlance. But she constantly went to a judge and said, avenge me of my adversary. And she went over and over and over again. And this judge, who did not fear God or man, finally said, even though I do not fear God or man, yet because this widow troubles me, keeps on troubling me, I will avenge her, lest by her continually coming to me, she just wears me out. Then Jesus said, hear what that unjust judge says shall not God avenge his own elect who cry out to him day and night yes verily I say unto you he will avenge them speedily now first of all we need to see This is a promise of the avenging of the martyrs. This is a promise of the avenging of the suffering of Matthew 24, verses 9 and following. They will deliver you up to affliction. They will kill you. They will persecute you. But, of course, he goes ahead to say, the one who endures until the end shall be saved. But here is this promise in Luke chapter 18 of the avenging of their suffering. When they would desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, the peaceful days of no persecution, but they wouldn't see it, there would be no relief, but they would cry out for vengeance, for vindication. By the way, this uh, this is pointed out to us here in the language of uh, Luke 18. I think it's verse 5. When the widow says, avenge me on my adversary. That word avenge is ek de kesis. It is the word that is used over and over and over again. In context of persecution and the avenging of the blood of the martyrs. Revelation chapter 6, the souls of those who had been slain. For the word of God, the testimony which they held, they were under the altar. They cried out, How long, O Lord, holy and true, do you not avenge us? Ek de kesis. On and on and on it goes, where this word ek de kesis is used. So this widow is, is playing the role in, in the parable of the persecuted. And Jesus says, Will God not avenge? His own elect who cry out to him day and night. And he makes the promise he will avenge them, ek de kesis, shortly, speedily, as some translations say. On that word, way, John? Yes. Um, there, ek de keo, keo uh, it's number 1558, uh, excuse me, 1556 in Strong's for those who uh, want to look it up means to protect, defend one person from another. And he cites Luke 18 and verse 3, which I think is very appropriate when you think about what was going on there. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a very, very important word. Uh, I mean, folks, just if you got a Strong's, or just go to Bible Gateway. Uh, I love Bible Gateway, by the way. One of the easiest used websites out there. One of the easiest to use Bible study programs. But you go up to the top, you go by BibleGateway.com, and, you know, they can send me a check for this free plug if they want to, but <laughs> I doubt they do that. <laughs> but uh, at the very top, it says study 
study aids. And it says words, you just hit that, that drop down menu, uh, word studies, and you just go right down the page and you type in the word that you want, type in the word of inch. And give, give all, you know, give the range that you want to be searched. Matthew through Revelation. You will be amazed at how important this word is in all of its different forms. Okay, now watch this, folks. We were talking about the great apostasy. Now, let's remember that this great apostasy is a part of the Jewish timeline. It is a part of what the Jews taught would happen in the last days. This is not a new prediction. It's not new eschatology. It's directly straight out of Israel's expectation of the end. And here in Matthew 24, remember, Jesus is drawing directly from Micah chapter 7, which predicted the apostasy during the days of the second exodus. And the second exodus permeates Jesus' teaching ministry, especially in the book of Luke, starting with chapter 9. But anyway, we won't go into that. Uh, we've already touched on that. So notice what Jesus says in Luke chapter 18. When he says, shall not God avenge his own elect who cry out to him day and night, surely, verily, I say unto you, he will avenge them speedily. Now, but one word right here, very quickly. The word speedily there is the Greek term entakai. It's only used about seven times in the New Testament. And it never, ever, ever refers to rapidity of action as opposed to imminence of occurrence. Never. I tell you, I'm amazed at the desperation of people to avoid the imminent statements of the New Testament. When did Jesus say all of the blood of all of the righteous shed upon the earth from righteous Abel unto righteous Zechariah would be avenged? Well, Matthew 23, 36, 34 to 36. Verily I say unto you, all of these things will come upon this generation. So all of the blood of all the righteous, that's the, that's the blood of the righteous martyrs in Luke 17 and 18. Those martyrs would be avenged in Jesus' generation. And here is Jesus speaking to his own disciples about the persecution that they were going to experience, saying, you are going to desire one of the peaceful days of the Son of Man. You will not see it. So let me tell you a parable. Keep on praying. Pray for vengeance. Pray that you will be avenged because I promise you the Lord will avenge you quickly, speedily. But now, all of that is the background to the teaching of the great apostasy. Now, you see, what we have here is this period of persecution of the righteous. And I could go into Isaiah 27, I could go into Isaiah 59, into other Old Testament prophecies that foretold in the last days the persecution of the righteous and the avenging of the blood of the righteous. Isaiah 26, 21 is one of them. And that blood of the righteous would be avenged in the day that Satan, the great adversary, the great serpent, would be slain. Well, that's Romans sixteen twenty. The God of peace shall crush Satan. Satan is the great serpent, the adversary. And he will do so shortly. Oh, by the way, that's the Greek term, entakai, of Luke 18. So here in this context of persecution, which is part and parcel of the Old Testament prophecies, of the last days, it's part and parcel of the Hebrew narrative of the end times. In that context of that persecution, that persecution that would lead, according to Matthew 24, 9 and 10, 11 and 12, Jesus said, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he even find faith on the earth. 
Uh, boy, I got to tell you, William, the very first time that passage reached up and just slapped me across the face, I was literally stunned. And I have to tell an anecdote here. At my very first public debate with Bill Lockwood that you mentioned, Holger Neubauer will be having a debate with him this year. But I had three debates with Bill Lockwood. And in the very first debate, which was held here in Ardmore, Oklahoma, 1991 or 92, somewhere along in there, I had made the point about the coming of the Lord. And I mentioned something about the great apostasy. I've forgotten exactly what it was. When I, I forgot the point that I made during the de- actual debate. But during one of the, de- one of the debates, uh, a break of the debate, I was on my way to get a drink of water. And a, a minister from the Churches of Christ who was there and attending, and obviously not a believer in covenant eschatology, he, he literally just grabbed me by the arm and he says, hey, you can't seriously believe all of that is fulfilled. He said, Paul said that the apostasy would occur before the great day of the Lord, before the coming of the Lord. You don't really believe that the, the, the apostasy has taken place, do you? I said, well, as a matter of fact, I do. And he, get, he goes, where, where did you ever get such an idea? Had his Bible in his hand. I said, well, turn, turn, turn over to Matthew chapter 24. I had him read verses 9 through 12. I said, now let me ask you a question. In Matthew chapter 24, verses 4 to 34, what's Jesus talking about? He said, well, the events leading up to the fall of Jerusalem. He said, I agree with that. I said, okay. Was Jesus talking about an apostasy or not? And he read it again. And he goes, well, yeah, yeah, okay. That, uh, that, was, a, that was an apostasy, but that's not the apostasy of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I said, why isn't it? Paul said he got his gospel, he got his doctrine directly from Jesus. That's point number one. But I said, upon what basis do you say that the apostasy of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is greater than the apostasy of Matthew 24? And he goes, well, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is the great apostasy. I said, where does it say that? And he suddenly realized that 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 does not use the term great apostasy like he had believed. And I said, now, let's look at verse 12 of Matthew 24. And I said, are you aware of what the Greek says? And he goes, well, no, I don't guess. So I pointed it out to him. I said, so here is Jesus saying that the love of... And I, I said, by the way, I said, do you like the new American standard? He said, matter of fact, I do. I think it's great translation, something to that effect. I said, okay, are you aware of the fact that the new American standard translation renders this? The love of the majority will grow cold. I said, now, let's just grant for, for argument's sake that Second Thessalonians chapter 2 is the great apostasy. Well, how great is it when we look at the Greek of Matthew twenty four twelve, and when we look at the New American Standard Translation, the love of the majority? And I said, now, let's go to Luke chapter 18. And I showed him Luke chapter 18 along with Matthew 23, that all the blood of all the martyrs would be avenged in that generation. That's Luke 18. And that Jesus then said, when the Son of Man comes, at the time of the avenging of the blood of all the martyrs, when the Son of Man comes, will he even find faith on the earth? And this guy was literally stunned. He said, I don't know how to answer that. I said, okay, fair enough. Just go home and study it. And that was the end of our conversation. And, by the way, that's the end of our show for this evening, folks. <laughs> Is that a good segue or what? That's a good, That's exit. A good one. Folks, thank you so much for joining us this evening on 
two guys in the Bible here on Fulfilled Radio, a voice you can trust. We truly appreciate it. We will continue our discussion of the great apostasy as a sign of the end next week. And with that, I'm going to say good night and God bless. Thank you for joining the Two Guys in a Bible radio broadcast. On behalf of Don Preston and myself, we'd like to say have a very pleasant day and may God bless. Until next time, we'll see you on Fulfill Radio, a voice you can trust.